the boats would dock here to come in and out. But look at the levels of the river, they marked with the, some hieroglyphic lines. And over there, we, in the end, we don't have time to see everything, but there's a Roman discovered no, Ptolemaic actually. Is it? Ptolemaic bass, yeah, where they discovered Flood hot, you. hot full of coins and all kinds of cool stuff. And, and just uh, recently. Now let's go back. Uh, the most famous and most famous. Hello, honey. Ram-headed sphinxes, because one of the one of the um, animals associated with Amon is the ram, which scholars takes as a, an indication that it's precessional, because it's the age of Aries, uh -huh. that um, when Amon rises to prominence, and that's right around the time of the ingress into the sign of Aries, about 2000 BC. No, the, those, those niches are for the flagpole. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't think there were here. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is Ptolemaic. This is the last bit. Where? The, the, the whole pylon. Next. Hmm? That's not Ptolemaic. That's the 30th dynasty king. Is that the Nebo? Last, last yeah. of the very, I think very it's still going on in Ptolemaic times. Huh? Uh, well, there are only the drawings. Look at the reliefs on the other pylon. Mm. Ah. Do you want
Sohaila. Sohaila? No. You go over there? Nobody called us yet. This guy is looking, but he's not. Who's looking? Yeah, this is the hyperstyle hall, which is the, the, so the crown of the, huh? the architectural crown. So it's him. What? It's oh. him. Okay. Would there have been a roof over a structure like this? What? Would there have been a roof over The roof, I'll show you how the roof goes actually. This is open to the sky. This is also open to the sky, but look up above, you see this lattice work, stone lattice work. Everything else is roof, and that lets just a certain amount of little bit of light in, and otherwise everything else is roof. <coughs> Hyperstyle hall means actually covered hall. This, from this part, it's Tutmosis III, the original, uh, cha you know, place. Then Ptolemy added this part. Anyway, once we're in, sort of arrange yourself around, so 15 of us will fit in quite handily. Max gets crowded at 20 and over. Just stake out your own place. You want back support on the wall. Um, once they shut the door, we tell them, on pain of death, be silent. And the same applies to us. But if you um, want to cough, cough. Crack, don't go, you know, don't go crazy. If you're not <coughs> used to meditating, you have to cough, cough. But um, otherwise, try and maintain a, a... How long, John? Well, I hope 20 minutes. Okay. I hope. What, when we tell you it Time. starts? Yeah, take pictures afterwards. Not now. Um, As I said, stake out a place and arrange yourself around. And uh, so, right now, about about you need a full a full half hour to use and use every second. You won't get a, around a quarter of it. It's, the place is enormous, but just uh, kind of it, it, it's good route to go. I mean, spend as much time as you feel like in the. Hyperstyle hall. I mean, here, this is this is this where we are. A lot of people just say, "Well, I don't, I don't want to leave here." It's, 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 there's a certain sense of being in the in the middle of this stupendous creation, which is got exactly what it is. And then go down the central aisle through the holy of holies. You can't miss it, the shrine, and then back to the end and around by the sacred lake. And anyway, wend your way back here. Um, so in half hour. hour. This is now 7, so you return 7.30. 7.30. But you will see us in the main axis. Yeah, see us in the main axis. And, you know, if, if you're not there pretty promptly, I will just start talking. And if you're just happy wandering around, you're absolutely at liberty to do so. We are so going to leave Karnak about 9. Around 9 we leave Karnak. And we will and go, go back to the breakfast. bus, so make sure you are in the bus yeah, if, if you yeah, if, miss if it. If you though. end up wandering around on your own, um, getting lost happens. Um, 
I, you know, if you have to, I mean, the bus is going to leave. We're not going to wait for everybody. If you We're really going get to then stuck, have breakfast. You grab a cab. I mean, it's not, it's not the end of the earth. We'll have breakfast, and after breakfast, we're going to look for a museum. To the museum, and then we'll spend about an hour and a half, two hours, and then the rest of the day, you're free to spend money. Mm. Or sleep. Uh, or Maybe. Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <Sarah>. so. Yeah. <laughs> John, why don't you? Spend money Hello, no, hello, no, 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 I can see it. it. Just now, you begin to see it. But I see the blue. Hey, it's it depends, you know. It, it, it really looks. Maybe the light has to hit it just right, and then sometimes it's quite spectacular. And since the one was the other good one was uh, was uh, that scaffolding in front of it and around the museum, so we miss it. But anyway. Okay. All right. Uh, we start off, and I'm going to take one by one the late ones to tell them okay. what we just covered. Okay. David. Summon the troops. Yeah. Oh, that's what summon the troops? Sure. Yeah. It's loud. If you don't, if you click in here, it doesn't do. If you click in here, you get. I, I just need a sound box. Okay. So I need a little tiny amplifier. To... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, on this side. Right. Maybe, maybe the mic, maybe the, the mic, your, to, to your voice, <laughs> is even better than amplifier. Okay, stand over here. Does anybody have a piece of bread for this one? That's a hungry kitten. Now, I hope everybody was suitably impressed first by Sekhmet and then by this incredible hypostyle hall. And you see, it's, it's, it's like no other hypostyle hall. We've been in a few hypostyle halls now, and they all have columns, and they all were originally covered over. But this one is in the temple that is consecrated to organic life. This <coughs> reproduces or sim reproduces symbolically the place where organic life is, you might say, the most organic, the papyrus swamp, which is like sort of like a rainforest when it's, when it's actually functioning. It no longer is, but the papyrus it grows like, I don't know what it's actually, what it's actual plant is. <coughs> Shut up. Go join the other group. The swamps group. are the weather papyrus. Papyrus. Actually, uh, they are it's, papyrus. Yeah, I know they're papyrus, but I wonder, <coughs> I'm not sure if they're a form of bamboo or what they're related to. Maybe, but, maybe horse, uh, but, what do you call but, it, bulrush too. Maybe. But anyway, when they grow, like the bulrushes, you know, it's just a, just a, a reed. But papyrus, when you see them now, you know, cultivated, they're you know, just a reed too. But when they're when full grown in the swamp, they're really like trees, like giant bamboos, this thick, packed close together and teeming with live birds and all that, all kinds of animals, swamp animals. So this is meant to clearly. I mean, it is a papyrus swamp. Everybody knows this, but this is meant to make it look exactly. As, as much like a papyrus swamp as they possibly can. And when you realize, and, so and hence, the, hence the densely packed columns, and the Egyptologists, believe it or not, say the reason why they packed these columns this tight was that they didn't trust, they didn't know the load-bearing capacity of vertical columns, even though they've been doing it already for 2,000 years. Things like this are staggering. And the real version, of course, is that it's meant to look like the papyrus swamp. And even to the extent that's an un a, you know, a unique feature, as far as I know, 
you see on the top of the, the lattice work there, mm -hmm. so that's, that's allowing light. A, a bit of light, because all of the rest of it is covered. And so that's allowing enough light to come through so that the whole place is, is in a kind of a, you know, a, a gloom, a half lighting, indirect lighting. And of course, every bit of it is painted, and there's enough left to the paint and under the architrave there to give you a sense of what it must have been like for the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's impressive enough as it is, but when it was functioning, it must have been, I mean, really spectacular to be in the middle of this, you know, dark, complete gloomy. dark, dark, uh -huh. gloomy, but vividly painted um, oh, hall. Um, oh, the sides, in, the side columns are shorter in order to allow, uh, the taller right. ones are only the middle eye now, to, to, to incorporate right. the, yes. the light. In the center, there are six, 12 <coughs> columns, 12 hours a day, 12 hours a night. Oh, thank you. 12 hours a night. Um, and then the other, this is again an interesting uh, instance of elaborate number symbolism. As I said, the six is enough. You know, the even numbers are, are sort of easy to account for, and they're kind of logical, two boards, easy to divide and multiply, and so on. When you get 11s, when you get 11s and 7s and 9s, it's a bit different. And here, in, uh, on either side, you have seven ranks of nine columns each. So that's a bit peculiar, you might say. I mean, what, what, sevens and nines? It's a lot more difficult geometrically to, to work with. But the sevens and nines are both integral to the, the, the sequence of number symbolism in that the seven represents, <clears throat> the seven represents pro excuse me, process or growth, that which is central to, to manifestation. When I go through the numbers wrap, and if you've read The Serpent in the Sky, um, it, it, it pretty, does a pretty good job, I think, of, of making the numbers live, because I, I tend to think, as you know, a writer by trade, I tend to think in metaphor and example, and most of the scholars don't think that way, so I'm able to put kind of a give living examples that, that make it make it all make it sense. So with the, I won't go through it now, I'll do it one, one either right out of the symbol or somewhere. <coughs> do a numbers wrap. But when we I use the image of the of the, of the sculptor and his idea, it goes very quickly or logically through seven and seven is where the, the, is the actual process of creating the statue out of the out of all the other all the other uh, constituents. And eight is, let's say, is a statue, but there, the, there the, the analogy runs out of steam because in real life, creation reproduces itself. And so, so eight, is, eight is, is, is the ability of, uh, the ability of, 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 of creation to it, it reproduce itself, and in fact, in, these things again have their their parallels in various esoteric or systems, and some of them familiar in um, in astrology, in Western astrology. Eight is Sagittarius, which represents exactly sex, death, and renewal. But renewal itself, recreation, takes place within, or let's say is 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 activated by pattern. It has to for it for it to for it to reproduce itself. Its pattern pattern is is, is essential, as you might say, the, the matrix of it of it of it all. And nine is the number. Pattern isn't included. Each of the numbers is, is itself because it's required. Actually, you can't just say, "Oh, why is three this and five that?" For good reason, because it, it doesn't work that way. Hard to explain in just a few words, but. I, I do explain it in the in the serpent, and uh, so nine is the number of pattern, and which gives you effectively the the all that you need to account for organic life. And here there are seven columns, seven ranks of nine columns each. It cannot be an accident, and that is in keeping with 
the overriding significance of this enormous temple, which is um, which is consecrated to uh, the breath of life over water, the animation of form, the organic world. Um, anyway, this is this is why we resonate the way we do here, which is different from the way we resonate in, let's say, the hypostyle hall of. Abydos or the hypostyle hall of of, of, of Luxor. It's for that particular reason. Uh, that said, uh, there's some very interesting things about the column the here. The earthquake that take not, took them all down. No, it wasn't an earthquake. Wasn't. It was the water. Flood, flood. The the uh, <coughs> early early 1900s. They were excavating here, and a number of the columns were toppled they over, but the, most of them the were okay. The the, the, the girl. See, I'm just about to tell that. You know that. Mm -hmm. um, and the guy who was in charge, the Egyptologist who was in charge, decided to take a lesson out of mythology to clear the temple of, of um, get the sand out of the temple. So he went back to Hercules, and one of Hercules's tasks was to clear, clean the Augean stables, which had not been cleaned out in 30 years. I call my workspace actually the, or, the Augean files, the Augean files, which haven't been cleaned out in 30 years. Anyway, the way that he did that was, I'm not, I'm, I forget which river it was that he breached, the Styx, I'm sure, I think, the river Styx, and he breached the levees and the water swept through the, 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 you know, the terrible stable and cleaned it all out. So here, in, in, when, before, when they had floods, there would be a levee on the Nile to keep the Nile, the Nile floods out of the, out of the temple. And so he decided to breach in flood, flood season to breach the levees and let the water go through. And sure enough, the water did go through. And sure enough, it did sweep out all the sands and so on. But it also knocked over the columns. It must have been a hell of a lot of water to, to do that. In so doing, they, the, the upside of that, well, they made a lot of work for, for, the local, for the local builders, but they also took out the pylon, and in the pylon, in the rubble, they found the, the, the ruins of, not the ruins of, but certain shrines and earlier portions of the temple had been had been dismantled in order to make room for the growing temple, and that they used as fill for the rubble, included in which were lots and lots of remnants of uh, the Akhenaten rain, which they actually didn't try to retain or anything like that. They just, you know, he was the great criminal, and they tried to destroy every vestige of him. But they found a lot of what's in the museum here, and a lot of what's in the museum um, in, in Cairo, which is not a tremendous amount, but it's still quite a bit, they wouldn't have had any of it had they not found it buried in the walls here. So that, that would be one of the upsides. Then, of course, they had to reconstruct the columns, which, which, which raises, to me, another mystery. As far as I know, nobody's commented on this, uh, though it's pretty obvious, and that is that Okay, the columns fall over and they, they build them back, the parts are all there, they put them back exactly as they were, repairing when they have to, you know, filling in with cement, the, you know, this sort of stuff there. But the neat behind it, that's, that's not rebuilt, it's just resurfaced, the columns are all there. But if you look at the bases of the columns, they're all different heights. And there has to be a reason for that. In other words, the columns are the columns, so they're restoring them exactly as they were. They're not, they're not creating new pieces for it. So it means that originally, these all must be different types. I cannot discern a pattern in there, but there has to be something, because it's a ton more work. I mean, if you build a base and you say, well, we'll start off with a base and we'll have it this high, or we'll have it this high, or we'll have it that high, you then have to calibrate all of the drums that, that follow on the way up. You make 10 times more work for yourself than if you just that, okay, we're going to have these columns this size, let's cut X number of drums of this height, and we stack them up on each other, and we've got, a, we've got our column. But instead, here, we have to calculate each, 
they have to calculate each column separately, especially if they're going to have regular size drums constituting the column. So I don't know. Um, if it's a tribute to organic growth, wouldn't it make sense that nothing is exactly the same? Well, it would, it would make sense. Especially if you say this represents the yes. breed swamp? Yes, it would make sense, but I wonder if there's if there's a pattern to it, or, is it, or they're just doing it. That's good, very good, that's very good thinking, Dane. That could just be, what? They're not sitting centered on these bases either. They're sort of yeah, it's, it's, that's, 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 as good as, that's as good an explanation as anything I've heard or could think of myself, that's for sure. Yeah, just in keeping with, but growth is different everywhere, so every column starts off different. And maybe there's no particular reason why it is the way that it is, just that it should be different. Yeah, that's as, that's as good as I can think of. Anyway, um, so that's the, that's the story of the columns, and as you see, in many places there are graffiti, and that tells you how high the, you know, where the, the level of the sand, all of this is in the Napoleon drawings, by the way. And in certain places, there are, like right across from where I am here, you see the Ankh there, and then it's, it's right centered by another Ankh. And I originally thought they're showing, and it's mostly a lot with the Ankhs, in certain instances you'll see the solar disk, going irregularly over the course of the sky. Uh, here it is, yeah, John. There's one over there? Yeah, OK. Yeah. And originally, I thought that yeah, it's a way of, of the artists of, of um, you know, of symbolically recreating you know, the path of the sun and organic life itself, um, which would be in keeping with the, with the, uh, with the significance of the, of the, of the hall. But I was corrected on that uh, because, as like in Abydos, Ramses came around, said he decorated it. Ramses came around, plastered it over for reasons of his own, and then hammered in his own his own um, reliefs. But apparently, very, not I, absolutely identical with what was there before, but close enough, <clears throat> so that now you get these multiple anks, anks, and multiple solar disks. And it isn't, you know, it isn't what I thought it was. It's just, and I, and, you know, it's, time took took away the uh, the the outer the outer um, skin, the outer uh, not where I'm looking for, the plastering over, and leaving us with this strange pattern. Anyway, okay. there is the hakuru, the upper lamp. Uh, yeah, the over. Yeah, the over. Here, yeah, anyway, there's lots of it, and graffiti all over the place. The, the fly, there's a lot of those. That's a bee. Little, that's a bee. Oh, a the bee. The bee, you see the bee and the bulrush there. The bee is one of the symbols of, of Upper Egypt, and the bulrush is a symbol of Lower Egypt. The bulrush being a symbol of, you know, papyrus swamp material world. The bee is a, an insect that alchemizes, in other words, it, eats its food and produces honey. <clears throat> so it's an you know, it's a symbol of, basically it's a symbol of, trans very, you know, vital symbol of, of transformation. And this and is a title, a one of the four uh, royal titles of the four cartouches of every king. It's the two is the king of king upper of and lower each. Good, so let us go. Let us This is, I think, the biggest of the obelisks still standing, and it was put in place by Hatshepsut, who seems to have been the most um, the, the most ambitious ambitious of the of the obelisk builders and and directors. And the question arises: We've already talked a little bit about, no, fairly extensively about the obelisk, and how it. You know, it's a single block of brick granite, and it has to come out of the rock in Aswan and be transported down the river. All of this is, um, all of our engineers here will, I'm sure, be marveling about how the devil they did that. And, and I mean, this is, this is quite a task. And then how they did it, and then the other question is why they did it. And we'll see in a couple of minutes. I already mentioned them as having a you know, a specific 
physical significance, not just the symbolics of like the, the academics say, well, it's a, a symbol of the sun. Well, it's a lot of work to symbolize the sun <laughs> in a 500-ton block of stone. They should have done all of that trouble to do, but as, as we'll see shortly, I think it actually does have a real physical, it's there for a physical reason, but <clears throat> how they get them into place is, is, is still a mystery, but there's a, there's a preferred there's a preferred reason or a preferred method that's as, as good as any I can think of, and so I'll, I go along with it because nobody has come up with anything better. What are you doing? Counting us? Are we all here? No, not here. Who's Nino here? Nino is not Nino. here, and two more. Well, well they'll find us. Ah, what? No, no, no. no so Sonia's here. There's Kiowa. Nino's always Nino, Nino is not Who? here. He's Who? Nino. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's all okay. It's okay, as long as he finds his way back. And as long as he doesn't mind, we don't have to mind. Okay, anyway, here's a here's plan of how they get it how they get it into place. Um, forgetting the quarrying and the loading it off out of the bedrock of the quarry onto rafts or, or big boats in flood season and then they get it down to the where it's supposed to go. They offload it from the boat, which is no mean task. You know, you X number of, of, of Steve doors aren't going to do it very easily with a 500-ton block of stone. Then they have to get it into place. So, okay, you have enough guys and enough ropes to pull it on sledges over slick mud. The right time of the year. Slick mud has a very, very good coefficient of what's it called coefficient of friction or something like that it's not as good as you know it's not as good as as oiled steel but it's pretty good it's pretty slippery stuff anyway somehow or another they're going to they're going to build they're going to build big mud brick ramp that goes let's say from the river up to here and then here here they cut and I think they needed, I think in the, in the theory they have a, another mud brick ramp going this way. I think that's what they're going to have to pull. <coughs> thing up. And then you've got the obelisk, and it's going to be coming up. There, there's our obelisk. And they're going to be pulling the obelisk up until it reaches. No, sorry. Here. They're going to pull the obelisk up until it's at its tipping point. And it's, it's gone over to here. They're get, they're finally going to get it to its tipping point, and then they're going to be able, you've got lots and lots and lots of guys with ropes, um, and not, not, you know, not donkeys or oxen, because the, the people are mocked. <clears throat> are are more manageable and can respond to instant command better. And they're going to pull it all the way over until they get it. And then all of this is filled with sand, and they're going to pull pull the sand out. And gradually, 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 they're going to get it centered in in the shaft. And then they're going to keep down below here somewhere, <coughs> maybe on the other side too. Yeah, let's see, let's go to the other side too. Down below here, they have a hole, and they're going to be pulling the sand out, and eventually they're going to get the, the obelisk down at the bottom and centered. Then, of course, then the last bit is sort of tricky, because it, when they've measured these, the way that it's it's centered on its plinth. It's to the millimeter, and it's perfect. And you know, unless they have like a big giant hair dryer, they're going to get the last bits of sand out, which must be a critical, a critical part. You can't leave a quarter of an inch in there, or it's going to be not right. So they somehow or another, maybe lots of guys are there blowing the sand out with straws. Oh, maybe. Why not? Anyway, they've got to clean it out, and then the thing is on its, squared on its plinth, and it's there forever, effectively. So that's the best explanation. Now, it almost seems impossible 
but to my mind, it's better, it's better than anything else that I've read. And we'll see when we get to Abydos that, that the king it shows, it shows the pharaoh, it's Ptolemaic, so it's late, it's, it's crude, but it shows the pharaoh raising a pair of obelisks with ropes. And so it doesn't show the thousands of guys that you actually are going to need to do it, but symbolically, he's showing that it's being done that way. So for the moment, case closed. This then raises, raises a few, whoops, what is that? Suspended, came loose. Well, you don't want to excite our normal women. <laughs> 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 John? What? Yeah, of course. So now we have some peculiarities out of this particular um, obelisk. If you look up, you see that. It's, it's all, the top third about has been sort of weathered. I'm not sure whether it is weathered, not a lot, but you see it's a different color, yes. and all the rest of it is absolutely as new. And, and then you see that it has the walls on either side, and the usual explanation is that the walls were erected by Tutmosis III, because Hatshepsut was, you know, was considered illegitimate and so in order to um, in order to well dishonor her or anyway get her out of the public consciousness took Moses who erected that obelisk there and there would have been another one a twin obelisk on the other side um, to erase the memory of Hatshepsut he built these walls in order to to conceal the obelisk, but he did leave the last third of it, which meant that Hatshepsut's memory would be, have been visible for probably a hundred miles on all sides, because you'd see the top of the obelisk. So if they wanted to build, to, to conceal her works from view, all they had to do was build the wall another third higher, and they would have done this, but they didn't do that. So this is a really pretty stupid explanation. John, can I ask you a question about the last part? Yes. How did they get the mud wall so high? That Those aren't mud walls. What mud? There's no mud wall. Well, the mud, you're saying that. Oh, ramp. the ramps. Well, yeah. they build a massive, massive ramp with enough, with, you know, with enough mud. It wasn't high. If they can huh? build everything else, it was I think not the very ramp high. is the easy part. No, All right. Not very high. Just one minute. Here. They did a, kind of like a pedestal, like this, OK? Not, not very high. Okay. Right? And here is. The ramp. Yeah. You see? It's not really high. It has to be as high as the other. Yeah. Uh, it has to be half the height of the other one. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be half when, the when, height. When, but not higher than much much of this, because when they yeah, bring no, the obelisk up, here, yeah, is, yeah, here yeah. is the pyramid. Up, 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 up. Here is the tip. Uh, yeah, here right, is so the base. Half the, of half the obelisk. Hmm. The base, the height would be half the obelisk. And it would be made of sand or no, mud? Mud. Mud, mud brick. Sticky mud. mud. Brick. Could even be rubble stone. Who knows? As long as it's not bad. Anyway, this is full of sand. Yeah, that's They fill this uh, of yeah. sand, and there is uh, there are uh, openings in the yeah, corners. That's right. well, that so when they when the when the when the obelisk when they yeah, put yeah. it up, it sits with anyway. the weight. The sand goes and it fits. Anyway. When we, when we get around to the fallen obelisk, you'll see that the obelisk, the, how, the resonance of the stone and the theory, when we get around to it, I'll, I'll explain more, is that the, 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 the obelisks actually serve as tuning forks, literally, to tune the obelisk to the earth energies that prevail <clears throat> at the site and each of these, each of these, um, the, the, the temples are themselves sited at particular points of latitude. They're not just haphazard. So, so there are, let's say, what's the word for it? Uh, terrestrial 
you know, the earth is not just a, a ball of a, a solid ball of rock hurtling around. It's filled with all kinds of all kinds of of terrestrial magnetisms and rhythms and and um, what are like vibrations. There are earth energies, and so the the, the um, if the obelisk is cut to the those resonances, it will it will serve as a literal tuning fork. And the temple, of course, is mostly enclosed, and it probably wasn't audible, but it certainly would have been. You know, there are lots of experiments with subsonic subsonic vibrations that become very dangerous. I mean, the French laboratory. Killed, killed everybody, or a lot of the people died from working with these subsonic, back this back by 30, 40 years, subsonic um, vibrations. Sure. They were you know, doing they were doing experiments, trying to weaponize sound, you know, underwater and things of that nature, and uh, did a lot of damage to themselves. So anyway, the so the, I mean, the John hypothesis is that these walls were built in order to damper. The, the the effect of the shut off. obelisk to shut it off to shut off the vibration and then the next one set of them would be appropriate the for one. the next you know for the next stage Level of construction of stage. because there were there were five stages I think there were five five four or five perimeter walls around here as, as the temple grew there's six or ten altogether there's six one way this way and for the other way. Yeah, when, uh, when, from, a, from an airplane, you see the temple is like an onion ring, sort of. It goes like this. Yeah, they're circles. Yeah, it's like not a spiral, one. but there are rings and r yeah. individual rings. And yeah. John, the pyramid top. What? Oh, yeah, and the pyramid top itself. Good point. Thank you. Sorry, the pyramid, the, the um, pyramidion on the top, which looks like and is. A, a little mini pyramid that were originally covered um, with electrum. I'm not sure how they know that or if that comes down from antiquity. Electrum is an alloy of 80% gold and 20% silver. And up until they came up with modern, what do you call it, superconductors, um, it was the best known conducting alloy. But evidently, you would think, they, the for them, for the Egyptians to have covered things with electrum, they would have would have known that. And in fact, in those days, silver was rarer, at least in Egypt, than gold. Gold was, you know, lots of things were gold. Gold was abundant, but silver wasn't that abundant. So to use electrum takes some takes some special knowledge. And there are reports of a of Asurbanipal. Yes. Uh, there was a yeah. Asurbanipal. Yeah. He in his coming through, dive. invading in, and he talks about seeing the obelisks at a distance, and it's like, and he says there are like lightning flashing between two. between the two from obelisks distance. from a distance. He can see he can see the energy flowing, on, you know, flowing between them, and that's an account I think from the uh, cune cune them. cuneiform from the <coughs> cuneiform records. Very Michael, interesting. Did you know now? How did they like the temple, the tombs? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, actually, in, uh, but it, an, an interesting bit that, um, you know, the, of the, these things do have a, a, a physical, um, you know, a, a, a real physical manifestation. <coughs> you know, they're busy trying to get the Rosetta Stone back. And I was going to suggest to you, know, Zahi, who I get along with pretty well, at the right, just at the right point to suggest to him, that it's just a waste of time to get the Rosetta Stone, which is a completely meaningless doc. Historically, it's important, but it has no, it has no symbolic or even artistic merit to it. And okay, the bust of Nefertiti, okay, but if you want to do something that really would 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 you know match his ego, he's try to get the obelisks back and put them in place, because that might make a real difference. It would certainly make a, di a difference. Aesthetically, if, if the obelisks were returned, why not but he got them kicked back. What? Why not coat them in electrum again? Well, and coat them in happens. electrum again. Why? Not? Well, you need two of them in order to do that. But yeah, there are a lot of things I could do instead of studying Tutankhamun's laundry list. So, but anyway, John, do you have a let's go. On, what? Do you have a comment on the, just 
that this is the top, the pyramid on the pyramid. The pyramidium? The top of this is completely flat, whereas this one is obviously <coughs> curved. The top of what is flat? Well, this obelisk is all flat. It's right angles flat. obviously curved. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know why. No. That's, that's relic, I think, unusual. I think almost all of them where they have the completed obelisk is the true pyramid and not something different. That's good. Good observation. I have no idea. Yes, but it's, I think it's uh, harmony between the length and width. No, I don't know. No, yeah, construction-wise. No, but it's curved and, and why is it curved when all the others are flat? Are, are, are regular. Let's go. Do we do that? Yeah, yeah. That's Okay, everybody. Okay, everybody. Okay. This is this is this is the sanctuary, which is not the original sanctuary. This one is put in by the brother. Oh, thanks. <laughs> we put in, it was erected by the brother of Alexander the Great, Philip Arhideus, but it, it goes along with the notion, pretty well authenticated, that uh, Alexander regarded himself, I mean, he was a Greek, but Macedonian, but regarded himself as the beginner of a new, a new stage in the, in the ongoing history of Egypt, you know, legitimately a pharaoh and so on. It's probably the case. Anyway, it's very unusual in that it is dual in nature, and you see the one, the two sides are very different from each other, and the ceiling, height of the ceiling are very different from each other. And as far as I know, I would have expected Schwab to have done a study of it to the millimeter, but I, as far as I know, he didn't do it. But my bet is that that these bear a golden section relationship to each other, that the the whole thing is harmonically designed with different, probably different um, different factors of of the golden section, you know, the square root of phi or the phi squared or something like that, that would that would be that, that determines the exact dimensions of these of these two this dual sanctuary. But you see the ceilings with different heights, and they're dual themselves. They're, they're two layers of stone. I guess the, the archaeologists say, well, it's really hot in the summer, and this gives them some relief, effectively, that it's insulation. <laughs> anyway, I don't think that that's to be a problem here. But what it does do, <coughs> you can hear what it does, actually, is that it, it produces a resonance. When we get into the, when we get into the uh, King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid, the resonance is so extreme that I couldn't even talk like this. You have to talk like this to make yourself heard because it's, what's the word for it? When it the reverberation is so tremendously intense that you can't, you can't have a conversation with each other. But meanwhile, this is this is this has a, a resonance of its own. Oh, what, one in, very interesting bit. You notice the ceilings are always well, they were blue, and they have the starfish, so it's the stars on them, but they're different. And you see that the stars here are just starfish, and the stars there have the solar disk in the center. And so and it's different so, color. And these are white, and these are red. And, and so this is an indication, because the, the scholars are always talking about the stellar cult and the solar cult, and they think there's a war between them or something like that. And I don't think there is that. It's that that's a recognition of hierarchy, like the zodiacal sky and the, 
and the solar sky, in other words, the year, the year as opposed to the, not as opposed, but as, a, as an, an integral element within the grander zodiacal or const constellational sky. And here you have actually in the symbolism, you have to, there has to be some reason why they had this starfish there and solar scented starfish there. This integration of solar and stellar stars explains it pretty well. Now you're not supposed to do it, but there's no well, one here. But if you go around here, this is a pretty special place. Just a minute. Here, it's here on the altar that the, that the boat, the, 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 the boat with the golden statue of a moon would have been best to be taken out on the festival day and brought down the river for, for the 10-day uh, celebration at, uh, at Luxor. And they managed to do this right. Um, well, you're going to do a yeah. minute? Let's do a little chance here. Mike, he has a, a voice. He has mm -hmm. a voice. Well, OK. Let's do a chant. <coughs> but we have to make it fast. Mm -hmm. Well, there's nobody here. Okay. We, 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 we divide these two of us, and there's a time for where are the strengths? Oh, that's right. Okay, let's go. Aho, 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 You know, usually the trips are more women than men, or evenly spaced. Mm -hmm. And here we've got all these, these baritone male voices that work rather well. Okay. Well, uh, it was a very sweet woman's voice, but that was me. We've <laughs> <laughs> been hiding this from her <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with my stick. Yeah, so what you John, yes. is the reason that it's carved out of the middle or the black and white? It's carved out of the middle and here. What do you mean? Right here. Right here. That's a little white one. It's a seat. Oh, no. I have no idea. What? When I first saw it, I could see it alone and I thought there was a plate. Yeah, John, it's... What is it? It's a secret. That it's notched in the loop, notched in the loop to a base in the loop box. This is the This is the sanctuary. Holy built by the the brother of the Sanctuary. He put it in here, and there must be a very special sanctuary. The bar of the moon over here, but more of it is not just the gold. Different part of the that is school. It's a different. 
It's a different aspect of the, of the cosmology. Uh, That's a good question, yeah. Yeah, but then uh, we will tell you how they started. Probably. And, one and, and a bunch of them for, yeah, for looks of it. John? What? Yeah. Is it later? Historic? It's like a later time period? No, it's not. Well, it's a sequence. I mean, I think it has to do, now that you ask it, I mean, it's not true. But the, let's say the cosmology that starts with that boom and goes in an end with us and so on. Right. Is, is you might say it's not a... It's not a temporal. I mean, it's one gives rise to the other, gives rise right. to the other, gives rise to the other. But it's not at all time sensitive. Whereas the Amon story is stems from the eight primordials of, who are darkness. Well, anyway, the eight primordials, which goes in stages, in which that reflects in procession, so that when Amun comes to comes to in the age of, of Aquarius. <laughs> Amun takes over from was the principle that was reigning here before, which was had a bull's head. Had a, actually, had a falcon's head. Was it's raining. It's raining. Uh -huh. so uh -huh. it, Bring it. Yeah. Oh my God. So and then when once in when, ten years when the age of Aries really? is over, yeah. I mean the lamb, the, the, the lamb of right. uh, Christ no. takes over. So it's more. Yeah. It's, 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 it's in some sense time-oriented, but it, it also is the stage of creation of the breath of life across the water. But it's different altogether. It doesn't, it doesn't it's related actually to relate. Time-wise, they give way to each other. <laughs> yeah, no, but yeah, but when Horus, it's, it's all of a piece. I mean, Horus and Horus, and it's like forever. Ramon now would no longer be in... In power, it would be the lamb, and it's, it's, it's Christianity takes over from from. Uh, oh, in the terms of the ages, in terms of, in terms of the ages, right. the yugas. That's right. Now, this is this is a Hatshepsut shrine here, and you see here you see the the reliefs are are pretty undamaged. I mean, the, the color has gone off them, but you see how how delicately they are, and there are her two obelisks, and there are the flagpoles somewhere. Where are the flagpoles? They're there someplace. Oh, there, right next to them, the flagpoles, the breeze, and and this is all the boxes, the gold. The these are all offerings, the offerings to Amon. All of and I'm I'm awaiting somebody to do a big paper or a big study of the of those offerings, because I'm sure that there's they're not haphazard. They didn't say, well, let's do twelve boxes of this and three thousand beers here and forty three geese there. There's some there's some there's some science, some method, I should say, not science, to the depiction of these, of these very varied, um, very varied uh, offerings. Probably having something to do, you know, with the principles involved in each of the offerings. The mm -hmm. geese are one thing, and the beer is another, and so on. This is the shrine that Hatshepsut built in, for Amunra, and if we just Wait, imagine it? crossing the river. Oh, first, well, let's go it's inside, exactly inside. on the axis. Right. Yeah. Right. Look, look at the color of the um, crown of yeah. Amunra. John, it's raining, you know? Yeah. Sure, it was all by itself. But 
it's, it's built in such a way that the obelisk, which is dead center, you see the yeah. obelisk dead center, if you follow that line, if you follow that line, it goes up the ramps of the Hatshepsut temple across the river. And her tomb in the Valley of the Kings, mm -hmm. as so, well, across the mountain. All these things get, you know, get planned in advance to a, a, an, an almost an obsessive degree of, of you know, of finesse. And here we see the, the um, you know, in really rich full color and, and perfection, the, the artwork of Hatshepsut's of time. And you see here, Jehuti, pretty much intact. Anyway, so the color, and there Horus pouring the Ankh over the Ankh of you know, water of life, literally the water of life, over um, the, the, the carefully, carefully, carefully effaced image of Hatshepsut. Another study why, in this case, sometimes it's Ankh and Anks and was acceptors, and sometimes not here. And sometimes it's Anks and was acceptors and jet columns, I think. Anyway, there's a reason for it, which we don't know. But anyway, you see the, the delicacy of the, of the relief work. As if it's been hand and half of the white across the. Half of the is, is obliterated. See? You just see the syllable that reads Amun. Amun. Yeah. Amun, because that's part so of that, her name. That, so that part was okay. Right. This is, you, you have to really enjoy it because this is the reward of the art of Egypt to you. After that, when we start going to the later periods of Greek Roman and later on, and, you know, it, the, it won't be this finesse. This is the ultimate, the maximum of best art ever. Yeah, well, but. Seti does. Seti, you know, there. you know, yeah, and actually, it's New Kingdom. New and kingdom. actually, Late Kingdom, but there's not much left late of the Late Kingdom they revived, but the does it have the same vibe? Uh, well, we don't know, because it's mostly yeah. the Late Kingdoms. So, elsewhere. anyway, it's one of the best examples, then later on, the trip will take us to a different era, which has its own beauty. And, and, and you know, it's, yeah. it's there, it's there. So this is the oldest known part of the temple. This is this is Middle Kingdom. Over there, standing colossal statue of Senusert or Sesostris in Greek. Uh, one of the one of the I think there were three or four Sesostrises or Senusertes. Not sure which one that was. But the Middle Kingdom is 2000 BC, BC to about 1750 BC when the Hyksos invade and then. It's about 200 years of where they rule Egypt until um, Amosa, the general who is Hatshepsut's grandfather, I think, takes over. Anyway, this is a big and very ruinous sacrificial altar of alabaster, calcite, technically, the geologists tell me, I don't know the difference, um, in which, you know, all animals would be slaughtered and the runnels would take the blood off. To what end? I'm not I'm not sure at all. But it's a, it's a weird stone to have as a sacrificial altar because mm. it stains, and you think exactly the wrong stone to use for that purpose. But 
whatever their purpose was. Maybe right? they were vegetarians. <laughs> then, they don't, then they don't have to slaughter bulls. Yeah. Anyway, um, let's go on. Um, hold on a second. We got, a, we got a picture on the other side. Really John, bad. I have a sketchbook. If you'd like to use Maybe. a sketchbook in a... For what? For what? what do you mean? We picked up a rock. I assumed you well, were going to draw on the ground. That's to something, enough. yeah. But, but, no, but that would, that would mark the, the stone, wouldn't Here's it? Here's a book. Sketchbook. What? I, I have a sketchbook in a pen oh, if you want to make no, a Oh, no, that's drawing. okay. Thanks. No, but the way I draw, it would make me look too silly. Okay, everybody, listen up. This is uh, my arm. Um, remember, remember when we were at the. Remember when we were at. Yeah, she segmentizes that. Now you know what segment means. That's sec segmentization. <laughs> now, remember when we were at the when we were at the um, yeah, tell them to take a coffee break. Um, we were at the solar boat, and I said, pay attention to those those there were tent poles that were quite unnecessary there in terms of the shape of these strange shaped poles. Well, here you see the columns are that shape, right? Those inverted, those, those strange, quite obviously phallic shapes and columns. And usual explanation is that this is called the Festival Hall of Tutmosis III. The usual explanation is that when Tutmosis came back from the wars, he, he remembered with, with great fondness his, his decades of camping out in the desert, carving out the empire, and so he wanted to be reminded of all of those good times, and so he had a whole temple built with columns to shape of temple. But Schroller, he used to say, had a different explanation, and to me it's one of the, one of the mo most remarkable moments of hypothesis formation or revelation or uh, of inspiration or revelation that we could possibly imagine. And that is, how do they, how, not only why, but how do they form, what do they derive this shape from? And Carlos figured out that Bala figures out that if you take, if you have a papyrus, you have two papyrus columns. <laughs> Next to each other. Uh, negative <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. Maybe this is better. That's fantastic. That is so fantastic. So, the negative space. So, what that is, is in fact obviously a phallic shaped column. Maybe the, maybe the basis of the original basis of circumcision, possibly. But anyway, what it is, is the negative space, it's, 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 creation. it's creation out of the void. Because this is the empty space that has been filled in. So in other words, it's the empty space has become the creative pr principle. This to me is 
incredible genius. There was no These are the fallacies of God, the earth God, inseminating right. sky. Right. Exact, exactly it's so. It's a wreck Very palace good. that we don't e see. Exactly so, the phallus of Gad. Yes, and if you notice... I can do that one myself. Yeah, of course you can. <laughs> He's great in yoga. He went from the master. Look at the, look at the uh, uh, halos, the saints, because this place has been transformed into a church. Look. Quite a few yeah, of the, those The heads of the saints, and, and so, yeah. As, as is customary, the, the, um, the Christians take over particularly sacred aspects of the temple, not just any which way, mm -hmm. or, you know, a particular space. It's, 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 always a, it's always a significant and particularly sacred spot within the temple itself. So initially, presumably, there's no big... There's no big war going on. That comes, I mean, the church invented intolerance, I think, and has done a, a very good job of spreading it around the world. <laughs> okay, let's yeah, continue. Thank you, John. Yeah. Shukran, I got it, I She started dancing and making me oh. rabat a tit, rabat a tit. <laughs> so why she, should we she, stop? See the French one? Yeah, they are all French. Oh no, they got workmen over here. But the, the workmen are Egyptian. Of course. Yeah. But she did not like me saying silent. Ah. But she, she shut up in the end. Ah. I hope. Now, <laughs> wait for everyone here. Rain this time of the year is very rare. Mm -hmm. We're here. Okay, everyone. Listen up. This is called the Botanical Garden. Usual story. Moses came back from the war, bringing with him all kinds of plants, sample plants, good scientists, botanists, um, animals, and things like that. And to prove to everyone what a great guy he was in a, an area of the temple that no one but the pharaoh was allowed access to, he boasted about his accomplishments by engraving on the walls the various plants and animals that he brought back with him. According to Schroeder, this is not the case at all, needless to say. <coughs> but it was, I'll show you why in a second, it was implemented and, and to me demonstrated pretty, pretty effectively on one of my early trips, there was a botanist along and I was talking about this is a place of transformation, as are practically everything in the temple. But he pointed out that these plants that are, that are illustrated, that are carved, the relief here, on the eastern wall, east being, east being the beginning, are the oldest in, the, in terms of, of paleobotany. These are fossil plants. But maybe they're still around or maybe not, I'm not sure, but these are the ancient, ancient, ancient level of plants, meaning that the Egyptians somehow or another knew their paleobotany. Very interesting. They are then, from the dinosaur theory, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're really ancient. And along here, various other, um, various other plants in various stages of flowering and birds and so on. And on the end here, on the, let's get in here, on. On the western wall, which is the wall of completion, 
the end of, you know, the, the transformational process coming to its conclusion, here you see any number of instances of the plants producing other plants from their own, from their own flower, which does happen in botany, but it's rare. And according to Schwaller, that's a symbolic, that's a symbolic acknowledgement of the ability to reproduce asexually, in other words, spiritually, in plant form. So this is this is born again. These are born again lotuses, uh, which is, of course, such an integral part of of Christianity. The born again. So the whole, so the so the botanical garden, the botanical garden is really. Um, another a garden of transformation which i think is which i think is pretty brilliant especially when it's acknowledged that the eastern wall are the primitive plants it would it, it, it's interesting enough to begin with as a as a you know as an explanation of why this botanical garden is seen at all but when when it is you know, when the botanist affirms that, that those are, that's paleobotany at work it becomes even more convincing, at least to me. Okay, let us continue. As always, I think running out of time. It's a John, why does the, the doors, basically, they stand like that one? They always... What? They, you can do the they're kept, they're stronger than the rest of the wall, or what? They always seem to stand to um, the end. Well, there, I think that's, I mean, that's, that might be a freestanding gate, you know, like the Arc de Triomphe. Because I think it's it's got the mud brick wall running into it. I'm not sure of that, but it looks like it from here, isn't it? Maybe the support. Or, or, is, or is the well, they need the support, after, but after, yeah. but you, usually it's part of the facade, you know, and it was part of the pylon. Maybe there was a pylon there. I can't tell from here at a distance. Okay. But when the three standing, that is sometimes like at Denver also it's standing. Hello. And everything else has disappeared. Is there ever evidence of those having doors? Or are they always just a gate, an arch, an opening? When they're when. Because I've seen, especially hit me in the Valley Temple, there are, you know, it looks like there are places for some. Oh, in some hinge. in some places there are. The big, huge hinges with where they would have had gold or gold covered huge wooden doors to shut the whole thing down. But I don't know if that applies to the actual main entrance pylon. I never really looked to see.
It's funny because you cloud it over in, in November, in October. That's not, that's uncommon. Maybe climatic ch climate change comes to Egypt. Then it's all over, so I'm not here. And they actually had some boat trips, the princesses here, it was nice. But now it's not connected, you see, it's so very... Actually, it's lower than normal, yes, Sir John? Yeah, it is lower than normal. Yeah, you see the water line, it usually is. But it goes up and down with the flood. Yeah, but uh, That's water it's table, not, not so directly refreshed connected. as a... Everyone, click, click. Not now. Explore the, the bottom of it, as I say. I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Probably not, they'd have to pump it all out. Empty out on its own. Okay, so all, all, every temple had a sacred lake. You saw the one at Dendera, if you did see it, it was relatively small and dried, uh, dried out and palm trees growing yeah. from it. Here is this one still functioning as it were. And at one point, as I mentioned to someone, at, 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 at the height of its, of its power, uh, Karnak, the Karnak temple had 30,000 priests associated with it, so you needed a pretty big <coughs> pool for them to do their morning ablutions. Pro maybe the origin of Christian baptism, but you know, purification by water is, is you know, central to just about every society that ever, that ever was. And if you actually can't work it out, if you have 30,000 priests at your disposal, and stand them on, and and then very closely packed. You'll see that this fits. Just thirty thousand crates they can get in here, but they get wet and stuff like that. But it's, it's and in every dope. corner of the, of this lake, there yeah. was a huge, second large scarab in the world. There is only one now. And it represents noon, the ocean. Primeval, primeval waters. The moon. John, the negative space that you drew with the yeah. pillars. Yeah. I remember in uh, Buddhism they talk about emptiness is form, form mm -hmm. is emptiness. Mm -hmm. I never understood what that meant, but I see it on the you graphically. You, you see it. Yeah. I yeah. know that's a, that's to me. That's a really brilliant stuff. Yeah. And when you try to put yourself in the place of what what allows you to notice that, that's, that's pretty amazing. It is. What, what did he notice? That negative oh, space, the shawler oh, noticing right. that yes. the, the form of that tent pole is is phallic, and it's it's, it's it's the empty space between the two columns that symbolize creation. It's that's brilliant. Mm. In Buddhism, they talk about the form is emptiness, emptiness is yeah. form. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you can't have one without the other. No, but it it doesn't register. I mean, it's, it doesn't it's an know. abstraction yes. until you see it. Yes. Well, this is one of the things that's so brilliant about Egypt. The, the, the Egyptologists, even, there are a couple of them that have acknowledged that, you know, that Egypt produced the greatest artistic and architectural masterpieces on the planet. And isn't it a pity that it's all in the service of superstition? Well, the, the part of the temple that you were saying was like the, uh, like you're walking in a papyrus swamp. Yeah. Yeah, the hatch valve hole. Yeah. I think it would, um, I mean, if it's dark and there's, you know, yeah, the it's all colors. Yeah, yeah, it would be really like being in the in, the, in the first, in the first, it's like the Garden of Eden. Okay. So it, the person walking through it, that's the experience that probably is intended. Put you in that, is it like a little bug in that, a little small little insect in the, uh, in the papyrus swamp? You know, yeah. You're kind of walking among these tall... Well, yeah, but it doesn't, even now, it, it doesn't make you feel dwarfed, as it were. It makes you feel... Me, me anyway, it makes me proud to be a part of this magnificent creation. But it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not like walking through Wall Street or something like that, where you, where you, you feel 
It's meant to diminish you. It's not. It's, it is sort of meant to put you in your place, I guess. I don't know. But you feel part of the, that place, even though... Yes. Yes. Okay, everybody. What is it? So I was like, click, click. Click, click. John is clicking. We will have a drive for five. Okay. <coughs> everybody, we're we're running out of time. Quick. Stragglers. Please, stragglers, stragglets. Um, for some dumb reason that I can't figure out, this is the. Large scarab, second largest they've ever found. You think you find bigger ones even? The bigger, the bigger so big. is in the British Museum. In the British Museum. Anyway, it was there were four of these on each of the corners of the of the pool of the sacred pool, and there's a local superstition that when the, the scarabs the scarab is really you know it's not really a, a fertility symbol, it's a transformational symbol, but the locals it became a fertility symbol and the superstition was that if you walk around women walk, walk seven times around the the scarab clockwise they will become present preg they will become pregnant that's president but, but in, my, in my in my in my in, in my in my trips generally they move counterclockwise contraceptive well, if it works one you know, way, it's John, If this is water, which is the, the life source, right. so to be, to exist, is the Yes, in, the, in becoming, I so mean... So, the becoming... In the becoming, I become... The, from the water. Right. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Good. Okay, let's go over Going here. this way. This is the big demonstration. One of the guides showed me this. I never would have noticed it for myself. So, I left... Yeah. Are these people going to give us They're a They're Americans. Time? They're your part. No, no. These are the guys. Don't blame it on us. Yeah, I took care hey, of the French. Hey, they're whoop. Americans. It's okay. No, that's not us. Sweet. John, is there any thought well, about the height or the ratio <laughs> of height of the obelisk? Um, yes. Lucy Lamy, they're, they're calibrated. Why one, why they're one way and why another, but they're calibrated. If Lucy Lamy had had me go out and see if I could get the dimensions, they are all of them some specific fraction, like a five thousandth or a ten thousandth or something, you know, not one two hundred and fifty third or something, of the of a of a degree of latitude at the latitude of the particular temple. They're this is so John Ted. This is like how how many tons? Okay, everybody stand close as you can. Close here. To, to close the, here. Can step out. This side. This side. That side. And be silent, please. One minute. Yeah, quiet. Be quiet. Move, move down where Zoe is. No further. That's where no, you are. You can't come in. Well, you no. can until they catch you. The pet has the last side. Okay. Give me this. Listen up. Be quiet. No, no, you have to go down. Here the time. Hurry, hurry. John, he says it's a little bit inwards. No, it's the point is where you get the most. You hear it? Oh, yeah. Like a bell. Yeah. Now, this is what? 90, 100 tons of stone set vibrating. I'm a very strong guy, so it's not just, it's not just a pussycat fist, you know, but, but, um, but seriously, the, I mean, who would have imagined that kind of the ability of, of, of to, to set vibrating a, a, you know, a 50, 100 ton block of stone? And I think it was that, because I think that, I think, that this idea of literal tuning fork is is a John idea, not a Schaller idea. I, I often mistake who did what. John, and, and you anyway, this, this what what is that? Amazing. So, but but it's that because I mean, if you given the resonant, the proven resonant properties of <coughs> of of granite, all stones will do this, but not like granite. I mean, any of the really hard stones will do this, and. Lucy Lamy sending me out to, to verify that these things are cut to specific fractions of the of the uh, 
of a, of a, of a degree of latitude, at whatever, whatever the latitude of the temple, it stands to reason and the knowledge that the earth is not just a spinning ball of rock, but that is replete with all kinds of earth energies and vibrations and seismic, seismic qualities, that these are literal tuning forks. And if you can imagine that when the temples are complete and they're all covered over, I mean, apart from the parts that are meant to be open, this, the whole temple would be a sound box mm. that you might, maybe even if you're sensitive enough, hear. And if the priests are then chanting and all the rest of it, and all of that is calibrated in one way or another or harmonically related to the, 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 the frequencies of that particular temple, you're going to get a really powerful, you're really going to have a really powerful experience out of that. What? It's a tuning fork, right? What with, is it? With, a, with vibration. Oh, I'm here. It's, right, the same right as, here. it's the same as the fork on the bottom of the staff as well. Uh -huh. Right? Look. Is it? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, what is that? They I use it tell. in music classes, you know, and to, yeah. to measure. Yeah. Look, here, uh -huh. this one, spiral, yeah. and then the big uh, uh, oh, bow with, 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 a, with, a, with, a, with a hand. It's a tuning uh -huh. fork. And the See, but it's actually a bottom. Did you take a picture? Did you take a picture? No. no. Vibration. So the bottom of the staff. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, really? That's the highlight to make for. That's the highlight to make for, right? John, what is it? Yeah. What is it? There is also for another shape of tuning for. I see it sometimes. Yeah, you could. Why not? Sure. Yeah. You guys yeah, let yeah. me go. Do I? Yeah. Get Hang it? Up on there. Yeah. What? yeah, yeah, yeah. Do? I want to take an audio recording of this. Okay, go ahead. But who is going to. You go with me. I have a big, yeah, yeah, big yeah, yeah. Okay, go. Big Dane. That's good. Dane, 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 Dane the hammer. I'm going to do this too. Dane, Dane the hammer. Quick, quick, quick. How are you? I'm not here. No, with the, uh, no, with your, Dane, with the, with yeah, the salt of yours. Come on, hey. Step back. You ready? Hang on, hang on. I'm going to find the sound recorder. Come on, man. Preparation. It's a throat chakra, by the way. It's been measured. Yeah. You ready? Oh, yeah, that's really good. It's right at the point, huh? Oh, the top is better. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the point. Yeah, the, point here, the, the, the point here it is. Yeah. It's better on the side. Yeah. Ooh. Wow, that's great, Dane. That's good. And Celesta, according to a musician that was with me once, he said it's measured to be sh the throat chakra because it's missing. No, but it's, it's missing, missing the whole thing. Yeah, yeah right. it's missing. Yeah, as that gets smaller, it gets yeah. closer to the top, that's the right. more your ability to, to start, well, to, to begin the oscillation, right? It's right. like it's narrower because you can deploy it more. Right. 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 So right. the vibration is going to propagate. Right. Uh, Except that when it's erected in place, nobody's going to Yeah, and the, the other thing, and the other thing is this is damped, right? It's mm -hmm. damped incredibly sure, it's damped. by, in, in two different places, so this is going to change the oscillation, but if this is freestanding, if I go up on the top of that and I'm not touching it and whack it, it's going to be completely different. So what about when it's covered with gold or electric? Would it do the same? It wouldn't affect it. It wouldn't affect its vibration. No, but it might. It might. It might on some kind of alchemical level. It's no. It's going to allow it to uh, interact with the fields, right? mm -hmm. yeah. with the electromagnetic Shukran. field, or any uh -huh. kind of transmission that isn't, right. you know, an impact. Here, the right. They, here it is clear. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah a spiral, you know, like a, a spiral with the with the with the with the stick. There is tuning fork, but there is also another one tuning fork kind. But we still use oh, them yeah. now. Mm -hmm. You see this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah. oh, yeah. so, 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 so
How many obelisks were there originally? Four? Huh? No, there were many more left. Many two, more two like two right there. They all been stolen and they moved to Rome. There is 47 in Rome. And a whole bunch. Those are the little so ones. Different place, different shapes, the biggest like one is, um, is in Rome. Rome of the most of the biggest of all. Different kinds of energy. But What's the name? The embankment in London and Central Park in New York and all over the place. Well, you don't know. You don't know, but I would guess it's from something else that they're either sending out or trying to harvest from. Right? Because all those are basically giant, giant, the giant antennas or amplifiers. Right? That's, that's what it is. How do you knock on something and have it? Noise this is the it's lateral the axis. Big, uh, the last of the pylons here started the sphinxes that we saw in Luxor Temple. So between the lateral axis, first pylon and Luxor Temple is about 2.2 miles with 2,200 2, sphinxes that we saw together. And we're interestingly next. enough, yeah. they just moved in this, yeah, this big, the, the crane. That crane has been right there in place since the first time I came to Egypt. Well, Nino 77. discovered that they built the temple with that crane. They are building yes, it. Yes, that's the, his theory. They are, they are building it? Oh, yeah. With the, that's they how had, they built they the temple. Well, they had helicopters. Uh -huh. and they had, so why that crane? And they had uh, cathode ray tubes. Uh -huh. So why not crane? Except that they migrate in the winter. <laughs> Sophistication. Civilization is at that level. If you have a sustained mediocrity, it tells you that the civilization is that. With us, we have high levels. We have very high levels of technological sophistication and idiotic levels of spiritual, of spiritual <laughs> comprehension or attainment. John, it's okay. ten past nine. Really? Yeah. You know what? We'll do it somewhere else. But we time. can say just a few important just, just things. a couple of things, yeah. The, the, the pylon here and well, the Madrid and the... pylon, yeah, we'll do, we'll do the golden section mm -hmm. and Fibonacci series later because it takes me 15 minutes and then we'll be late for breakfast and we don't want to be late for breakfast. The ruinous wall here, that's what, that's what happened when they, when they let the floodgates loose. 
the ram-headed sphinxes are all included here. And at the end, maybe deliberately, because this was built by Nebo, the last of the Egyptian-born pharaohs, and then continued by the Ptolemies, but not completed. And it's strange that they left unfinished the last column. This is some civil do that. The Swedenborgians have their own church, the Swedenborg church. They deliberately leave unfinished a, a you know a part of the temple, a part of their church. And here might be, and they left unfinished the, the westernmost column, suggesting anyway that you know that completion it isn't yet complete, fully complete, and there's work still to be done. Don't know if that's the case For or a not. For a temple but. that is consecrated, and it's it's, creation. And in that, that yeah, and in that ruinous wall there, that's where they found all of the Akhenaten stuff. And I'll deal with the, with the. I mean, here, each of these, most of these, constituent, the constituent elements within the temple, that's Ramses III, and they're all, all different, built by different pharaohs. But wherever there's a building, almost all of them conform to. Fibonacci proportions, which are very specific, uh, 24, you know, 21 to 34, 34 to 55, etc., etc. Anyway, let's let's head off. And this now. court is the biggest court, and it is, you know, the Harka, one of the last kings. It's, that's and the, his before it, the, the sphinxes of Ramses II that you saw out connected this pylon that was made by Seti the first and Ramses his kid all the way out, so they had to remove them and pack them again here in order to add the court Well, they're storing, the them, they're storing them there for the next yeah. age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, and this is uh, the Sphinx here, the um, amazing quality of limestone. It's of Tutankhamun, one of the fewer things of Tutankhamun is in Skyrim. Do you have a cartoon? So we will oh, yeah, it's uh, back good. direct to the bus to reach your breakfast. Hello. Hello. You know, when, they, when everybody goes to the... Um, goes to the... Breakfast? Uh, to the museum. Yeah. I want to quick stop. Yeah.